In this lecture, we're looking at Calvin's return to Geneva, and we're just going to take a brief look at the world that Calvin was returning to. Because too often it's assumed that the Geneva that Calvin returned to is really the same Geneva that he had left only a number of years prior. Well, the situation was actually quite complex. Calvin, as we saw, had been kicked out of Geneva in large part due to the fact that the complexities on the ground were not conducive, let's say, to an idealist like Calvin or Farrell standing there wagging their finger, telling them how they ought to reform the church purely right now. Well, the situation had actually grown a bit more dire. Over the years that Calvin was in Strasbourg, Geneva again began to tussle back and forth internally as to whether or not they were going to align themselves with Bern or whether they were going to return to the Duchy of Savoy, who had been their previous sovereign. Now, of course, Savoy is Catholic and Bern is Reformed. And the tensions back and forth are not all theological. Those who might want to return to Savoy were not necessarily thinking so because they were simply Catholic and they wanted to return to the native church. In terms of the politics on the ground, a lot of this has to do with the stability of the city. In fact, by 1541, when Calvin returns, Geneva is broke. Its coffers are empty and, not having a standing army, it is in no place to bargain, really, with anybody. Well, when Calvin was reinvited back to the city, he was invited back by a portion of those in leadership who supported the reform movement, and in particular, were at least leaning towards the city of Bern as their source of political and military power. Now, the goal is always to be independent, to have one's own two feet on the ground, and to not have anyone really telling you what to do in this day. But Geneva is not in that place because they are broke and because they have no way to protect themselves. And so when Calvin is reinvited back, it is not a unanimous decision. Not everyone is happy that Calvin is returning. In the government, in fact, there had been a turnover, and those who were in favor more of the Savoy line of argument, those who wanted to return maybe to an older form of stability, were not welcoming Calvin back, and they had been overturned in an election there in Geneva. A number of these folks actually have to flee, and in fact, the situation that Calvin steps into is quite complex, really. But when Calvin arrives, he is not the same person that he was when he left. Now, Calvin, as we've seen, had a bit of cold feet, you might say. He didn't really rush off to Geneva even after he agreed to go there. He repeatedly asked the people of Strasbourg and Butzer to kind of intervene on his behalf to tell Geneva that Calvin had some work left to do and that he would rather stay in Strasbourg for at least a period of time before heading to Geneva. But his cold feet really are probably more driven by the fact that he had established a life in Strasbourg. He had married. He had a home. He had a father figure in Butzer. The thought of leaving Strasbourg weighed as much on his mind as the anxiety to travel to Geneva and to take up the hard ministry there. But as we've seen, again, Calvin is a new man. He has been humbled. He has been separated from Farrell, at least sufficiently. They still sent letters back and forth, of course. But they have been separated to such an extent that they are now no longer able to kind of excite in each other the complexity of the fervor that caused them to throw down the gauntlet whenever someone crossed them theologically or pastorally. Also, Calvin is a married man. He is wizened and more mature now than he was when he left. Well, his cold feet notwithstanding, eventually Geneva prevailed. In fact, they prevailed because they sent an entourage, a mounted group, up to Strasbourg to escort Calvin back. Now, don't see in this arm twisting, of course, Calvin had agreed to go back. This was more of an issue of sort of pushing Calvin to come now, to return to Geneva as soon as possible. And so, in September of 1541, Calvin goes with the escort of the Genevans, and he travels back to Geneva. He leaves his wife behind to gather up their things and to make arrangements for everything to be moved on after. Now, again, a couple of sort of little vignettes as to what Calvin was like when he entered the city. There was at least a tone within those who were in leadership in Geneva that they really wanted to roll out the red carpet for Calvin. 
They really wanted to welcome him. They wanted him to be at the lead position amongst the pastors there in the city. They, for example, gave him a home, actually a really significant home there in the city. They gave him a pretty substantial wage. In fact, he was paid more than some of the more senior magistrates in the city. Now, some see this as sort of buying Calvin off. It's not. What they're actually doing with Calvin here is they're making him essentially the Luther of the city. Luther had much the same situation in Wittenborg. His home was sort of a public forum, a public place for those within the city, in particular the students. Calvin's home, this new glorious large home, as well as the wealth and the support of the city, meant that they wanted Calvin to be the mentor, to be the man who was leading the charge for the church there in Geneva. But Calvin, this is very interesting about his personality. Despite the fact that he likes to be right, (laughs) despite the fact that when someone crosses him or challenges him, he finds the more waspish side of him coming out. And this is true all the way until the day that he dies. But despite the fact that we see so often in Calvin a desire to respond pretty sharply whenever he needs to, in this case, he does not grandstand for one moment. He actually requests, he denies that anyone should throw a big welcome reception for him when he arrives. He wants to simply roll into the city, take up his new lodgings, and get to work. Now, there's something in this that is important for understanding what Calvin thinks that he's doing. The fact of the matter is, is Calvin has the luxury now, as some of us have probably experienced in our own life, where he was accused of something, and that accusation took root for a period of time. In this case, he was accused of being suspect in his theology and of being a troublemaker. And he was humbled from this. He actually had to own up to this. He couldn't say that he was simply wrong and that the accusations were entirely false, at least in terms of the troublemaking piece. His theology wasn't ever really in doubt in his own mind, of course. But Calvin now has the luxury of having experienced the humility from tucking his tail between his legs and running off to Strasbourg where he is mentored by Bootser, to now actually having vindication for his original purpose and design for the city and the church of Geneva. In other words, emotionally, personally, Calvin has an enormous leg up in terms of his momentum when he arrives there in the city. But, very characteristically, he does not grandstand. In fact, one biography actually tells the story that when Calvin preached his next sermon, when he entered the pulpit, that he actually churned to the very next passage, the one after the sermon he preached just before being kicked out. And in a somewhat showy display, though he didn't say this from the pulpit himself, he just picks up right where he left off. The work, in other words, needs to continue. It's not about him. He's not there to grandstand and to rub their noses in the fact that they had brought him back. In other words, I don't believe that in Calvin there is a false humility. I don't believe he's humble to the point of getting what he wants. I think he's actually truly received some humility here. He has become a married man, and now he's coming back with the sort of hoary hairs on his head of a man who knows something about gray area and not everything being black and white. Well, if the complexities in the city politically are one problem, the other major problem is that Calvin now in 1541 is given full reign over the church. Now, the city is very clear on this. It is the magistrates, it is the city leaders who appoint and call and pay for pastors. Calvin is not some sort of little pope in Geneva. That's one of the great myths, actually, that Calvin had sort of full sway and authority in the city. Hopefully by now you can see in these lectures that Calvin, in many ways, has very little power native to himself that is not at least somewhat on rocky ground should the city have an upheaval in terms of the next election. But for now, in 1541, it is Calvin's job to reform the pastorate. And this really, for about five years, becomes Calvin's sole purpose. Calvin actually believed, and there is solid evidence for this, that the pastors in Geneva 
were kind of a ragtag, bad news bears group of guys. In other words, what is going on in Geneva is you have a city that's but half reformed, really. The city has only embraced the Reformation somewhat piecemeal. They've never had a leader. They've never had any clear conviction along the way. And as we'll see in a moment, Calvin actually is the first to bring that to the city. But when you look at the pastorate, those who are actually leading the churches, they are not the best lot of people to be leading a Reformation. A lot of them are local boys, and most of them are profoundly undereducated. Now, when I say that, please don't hear some sort of snobbish sense that these people have to be doctorate-holding savants at humanism and biblical languages. I mean, these guys are just slap uneducated. And Calvin writes a number of letters about this. He is not happy with an uneducated clergy. Now again, people have made a great deal of this. They think that Calvin only is a lover of the mind, that he wants more obtuse, systematic theology being preached from the pulpit. Actually, from his letters, he says the opposite. What Calvin describes as an ideal pastor from the vantage of the pulpit is someone who is profoundly well-educated in the scriptures, not just well-educated in and of itself, but someone who knows where they stand scripturally on the key doctrines of the faith. This is, after all, why he's developing the Institutes. He wants to have a book that he can hand to people and say, here is what you need to know, at least in terms of being conversant with the issues of the day. But Calvin also complains in his letters of obtuse, boring, snooze-fest type sermons of people that are there simply for their own sake. Again and again, the humanist in Calvin comes out. What he wants is lucid brevity. Clear, two feet planted on the ground, knowing what their sermon is about, but communicating it effectively and clearly to everyone there in the congregation. And so for the five years that Calvin is there in Geneva, reforming the clergy, from 1541 to 1546, his focus is to find the kinds of pastors who will really shepherd the flock and who will really teach the people. That's always his focus, he says again and again in his letters. The other reality, though, is that there were some who were still Catholic. They had simply held their nose for a while, and they were going about the standard practices of the Roman Catholic Church, even though by name and by charter and by the standards of the city, it was now a reformed city. Well, around 1546, what has happened, and there's a giant influx of this in 1546, is Calvin has churned over the pastorate from local boys, from local people who had risen up through the ranks and taken the pastorate. And he has actually imported a lot of people that are frankly like him. French-speaking, well-educated, at least biblically well-educated men who come to the city and take the pulpits, either because they are in exile just like Calvin, or because through the reform network of friendships, they had been called and summoned to the city. And so it's really not until 1546, and frankly, the experience on the ground, it's really not until 1550, frankly, that Calvin really begins to feel that the Titanic is churning ever so slowly as he is reforming the pastorate, as all the company of the College of Pastors, which we'll look at in our next lecture, are meeting and educating one another and edifying one another, and that the wellspring of biblical knowledge and literacy is beginning to flourish. In other words, it's not until roughly 15 or so years before Calvin's death that he really begins to feel that he's having an effect on the pastorate in Geneva. For Calvin, it is from the pulpit and as the pastor that the most change will be affected in the lives of the men and women who are in the congregations. As we'll say in our next lecture, all the comments and the complaints and the head scratching that we do in the 21st century about the way Geneva was run as a political engine, as a political machine, belies the fact that for Calvin, it was the pastor in the pulpit that were supreme in terms of changing a city. And so Calvin arrives and he returns in 1541. And frankly, for nine straight years, he sets about to really affect and change the world that he is ministering to there in Geneva. And frankly, one of the best indications 
of what Calvin really was about is the fact that, frankly, from the time he arrived in 1541, with a little bit of lag time as he gets his feet under him, until, frankly, just about until the time that he dies, Calvin preached a one-hour sermon every day. The churches were opened, a sermon was preached in a number of the parish churches in the city. And Calvin, though he himself was not ordained, he was not a pastor, he was a doctor, he was a teacher. Calvin believed that the pulpit was so important that until the day he died, just about, just short of that, when his illnesses began to weigh on him, Calvin preached a one-hour sermon there in Geneva every day, frankly, with obvious exceptions for rest and these kinds of things. Every day he was there in the pulpit. And so in the end, when Calvin arrives back in Geneva, the complexity of the city, the political issues, again, of Geneva and his loyalties to Bern or to Savoy, as well as the complexities on the ground, meant that Calvin not only had to preach, but he had to concoct and invent and devise a system of order and worship and liturgy, a real culture, you might say, that he wanted to leaven the entire city. And so we're going to begin to look at some of those in our next lecture. Okay, that's it. In our next lecture, we're looking at Calvin and the organization of not only the church in Geneva, but also the city itself. What was Calvin's culture that he attempted to build there in the city that had now called him home? Mm -hmm.